Hello, Dr. Robert Stevens here from the Men's Health Clinic. Firstly, thank you very much for inviting me today to talk to you about testosterone in diabetes. I'm the medical director and founder of the Men's Health Clinic, a clinic that specializes in the management of men with testosterone deficiency. We now have over 700 patients from 15 different countries outside of the UK visit our clinic in the UK. I've also recently been tasked with managing the neuroendocrine dysregulation that occurs as a result of complex post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury in veterans. This has led me to do further reading and investigation into something called the polyvagal theory that is not traditionally adopted by modern medicine. This has given me more of an insight into the fact physiology is more important than psychology. We should be working with nature, not against it. All of my guys present with an element of low mood, anxiety, and or depersonalization, or simply just not feeling themselves. Through normalization of their melandrin profile, we see an improvement in their psychological status. I've had some guys actually admit to me prior to TRT, they were actually suicidal. So do not underestimate the importance of normal physiology on mental well-being. It is incredibly important. So let's talk about the topic at hand, testosterone in diabetes. This is a review paper written by my esteemed colleague, Professor Hackett. This demonstrates a bi-directional relationship between testosterone deficiency and type 2 diabetes. We need to appreciate the importance of addressing the patient as a whole. In medicine, unfortunately, it has become too specialized and we treat the condition, not the patient. When I see somebody, I want to have a holistic approach to their patient care. So not only do I correct the testosterone deficiency, I counsel them with regards appropriate lifestyle measures they need to take, nutrition, and physical exercise. When we think about hormones, all hormones are dependent. They are not independent. Whether that relationship be direct or indirect, we need to realize if we improve a metabolic condition, it will have a cascade effect on other physiological parameters. If we allow a condition to deteriorate, it will then have a cascade effect on the other physiological parameters and we will have a negative outcome. We need to adopt a holistic approach to medicine. Medicine has become very specialized and that is actually its downfall. We need to be a generalist and especially when it comes to conditions that affect numerous organs and tissues throughout the body, both type two diabetes, increased insulin resistance and decreased insulin sensitivity and hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. So what are we going to do? Well, we need to screen these people. We need to identify risk factors and we need to implement a progressive management plan. This study demonstrated the effectiveness of both testosterone replacement therapy and lifestyle measures on men with type 2 diabetes. Disappointingly, some of the patients had to come off therapy because of a rise in hematocrit. Now, this can happen with testosterone replacement therapy. However, it should not happen with a well-balanced TRT protocol. Why? We are simply normalizing physiology. So there is either something wrong with the protocol or the person has a confounding issue, such as obstructive sleep apnea. This is known to worsen in men with TRT. Uh, if somebody has hemochromatosis, if somebody's a smoker. So rather than being reactive, we should be proactive. We should be looking for causation and addressing side effects as and when they occur. But on a well-balanced TRT protocol, you should have healthy melandrin levels, ergo healthy melandrin levels. 
the premise behind TRT is normalizing physiology. Let's go back to basics. We're going to talk about the HPG axis, the hypopituitary gonadal axis. This is a self-regulating negative feedback mechanism whereby your body self-regulates the amount of testosterone it produces. The hypothalamus sends gonadotrophin releasing hormone, GnRH for short, down to the pituitary. The pituitary sends luteinizing hormone down to the Leydig cells of the testicles to produce testosterone and follicle stimulating hormone down to the Sertoli cells to produce sperm. Now within the testicles, the intratesticular testosterone helps with spermatogenesis. How? Well, through aromatization of testosterone to estrogen, that helps spermatogenesis. Estrogen is incredibly important. Now, when testosterone is in the circulation, it can be used as testosterone, it can be converted to dihydrotestosterone, and it can be converted to estrogen. They all feed back to the hypothalamus and pituitary to tell the brain that you have enough testosterone. Now, what happens in diabetes? Well, obesity is a real issue, not only for, for diabetes, but for metabolic syndrome and numerous other conditions. We are not a healthy species. I always joke, is it a joke? I always tell my guys, if you're fat and you're a prey, you're gonna get caught first. And if you're fat and a predator, you're not gonna catch your prey. So, obesity, increase in adiposity. Adipose tissue releases leptin. That can have a negative effect on the Leydig cells of the testicles. Insulin is anabolic. Insulin resistance means less insulin, less testosterone. You can have a problem with the testicles. That's a primary hypogonadal picture. A problem with the brain, that's secondary. You can have a problem with prolactin, that's tertiary. And I also believe we have a fourth cause of hypogonadal, hypogonadal, uh, I think we actually have an issue with estrogen. Our excess propensity to aromatization causes negative feedback to the hypothalamus and pituitary, essentially tricking the brain into thinking it has enough testosterone, and so it no longer sends the, the right amount of LH and FSH down to the testicles to produce testosterone. And then essentially you go into a little bit of a vicious cycle, and people become hypogonadic. So the testosterone that gets released by the testicles, most of it gets bound to SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin. This is a glycoprotein produced by the liver. Some of it gets bound to albumin, another protein produced by the liver. So it's essential to have a good, clean, healthy diet to optimize not only liver function, obviously, but also production of these proteins. Now, obviously the liver is obviously negatively affected in type two diabetes. So if we can improve outcomes, we need to look to improve our adiposity to decrease estrogen and also improve liver, liver function. So what is the purpose of sex hormone binding globulin? SHBG essentially is a buffer. The half-life of testosterone, DHT and estradiol is very short. We need to use testosterone, estradiol and DHT all throughout the day. So the primary purpose of TRT and testosterone is to help facilitate growth and repair. So the SHBG acts as a buffer, but it also actually helps in modulation of transfer of testosterone into the cell. Our understanding of SHBG is increasing. SHBG is a positive health marker. So what happens in our cohort of type two diabetics and men with metabolic syndrome? SHBG lowers. This infers a negative health outcome or consequence of type two diabetes and metabolic syndrome. 
Why it lowers is interesting. It's debatable. And I believe that it lowers as a consequence of the low testosterone. So essentially what you want to have is a nice proportion of SHBG to albumin to free testosterone. Now that's not true for another condition, which is hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism, where you see a elevation in SHBG and respectively a decrease in SHBG. So this is a hypometabolic syndrome. So low testosterone causes low SHBG, hypothyroidism causes low SHBG, uh, and type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome causes a low SHBG. What we see with optimized people on testosterone is an improvement in their SHBG. So 2%. 2% of that testosterone is that feel-good hormone. People want to lower SHBG to increase this. You don't want to do that. You want to have a nice ratio of SHBG to albumin to testosterone to help facilitate growth and repair. The primary purpose behind testosterone replacement therapy and testosterone within the natural processes in the body. As we said, Testosterone gets produced by the testicles. Some of it gets produced, uh, converted, sorry, to, five, to di DHT, dihydrotestosterone by 5-alpha reductase. Some of it gets converted to estradiol. Well, the main metabolite is estradiol. Now, the aromatase enzyme is located in numerous tissues. Estrogen has both endocrine, paracrine, and autocrine effects. So which tissues is estrogen located in? Now, as we've already said, the testicles. We also know that it's located in the brain. So estrogen is integral for mood, libido, and uh, cognitive function. But too much causes anxiety and obsessive compulsive symptoms. It's all about balance. What else? We know it's located in the bone, so actually it'll improve bone strength. It's also necessary for cardiovascular health, so it helps maintain the endothelial lining of blood vessels. So what happens when you have too much? Well, people complain of water retention and blood pressure. It all boils down to this concept of balance. There are two organs within the body which you can directly influence and affect a positive change to your testosterone to estrogen ratio. And these two organs are directly affected by type 2 diabetes, stroke, obesity. Guess what? Guess what they are? Fat and the liver. So increased adiposity causes increased conversion of testosterone to estrogen and liver dysregulation causes increased conversion of testosterone to estrogen. It's all about ratios. It's all about raising these anabolic hormones or lowering these anabolic hormones and relating them to the catabolic hormones that are, exist within our body. Now, testosterone levels follow a diurnal pattern. Anabolic processes predominate overnight, which means that your testosterone spikes in the morning. Your cortisol also spikes in the morning. Why? We are supposed to be active. The process of homeostasis is incredibly complicated. This principle of maintaining a constant internal environment despite external changes. It's incredibly complicated to make our lives incredibly simple. If we concentrated on physiology and looked after our lifestyle, namely stress reduction, improved sleep, if we looked after our diets, essentially I'm a big advocate of low carb, high fat, uh, pescatarian Mediterranean diets are my go-to favorite diets, but diets are particular to the individual and also physical exercise. We are physical beings. 
Now, what's happened to our society? We are quite possibly the sickest species on the planet. We are supposed to have a higher state of consciousness. What has happened to it? Well, the model is wrong. We wake up, we walk to the fridge, we start our metabolism, we drive to work, we have a day full of psychological stress, we drive home, we perhaps have a nice scotch when we get in, have some dinner and then go to bed. We are supposed to be physical beings. The spike of testosterone and cortisol in the morning is for you to be active. Go hunt, go gather. What I want you to do is earn your reward. And what's your reward? Your reward is food. So I think we need to work with nature, work with our biology. We can use science, but actually have an appreciation that the model is distorted, the model is wrong. We are sick. We need to redress this. We need to concentrate on the fundamentals of health, lifestyle, nutrition, and exercise. Then look to hormonal health and then look to modern medicine. Rather than reaching for the path of least resistance, that is actually because obviously we still have internal drives. So we should seek the path of least resistance to keep to get the maximum reward. We shouldn't seek the path of listen, resistance to, be, to, to, uh, to reach the reward because we are missing out some very necessary steps. We are not working with our biology. So when it boils down to it, we place too much emphasis on psychology over physiology. Now, if we take erections as a example, which is obviously of primary importance to us chaps, Erections are primarily under parasympathetic control. Erections are complicated. They're a neurovascular mechanism under hormonal control. But the autonomic nervous system, this element is actually parasympathetic. Now, rest relaxation. Now, if you understand the polyvagal theory, you'll understand about the it's actually social engagement as well. So to attain an erection, you need to be in a parasympathetic state. Orgasms ejaculation is sympathetic. So these poor guys stressed out about not being able to have erections, they're only compounding the issue. Now, how can you manipulate your autonomic nervous system? Well, you can start the parasympathetic system by uh, eating. Mid-coitus, that's probably not a good idea. However, you can directly influence your parasympathetic nervous system through breath work, controlling your breathing. Now, interestingly, we are working with Richie Bostock, Bostock uh, who is a, the breath guy, uh, and we will be launching uh, a program to help not only our guys with testosterone deficiency, but also the guys with complex post-traumatic stress disorder and TBI to improve outcomes through direct manipulation of the autonomic nervous system. As I've said before, the body is incredibly complicated to make our lives incredibly simple. This premise of the polyvagal theory, fight, flight, you're not supposed to be a um, horny goat boy with uh, the danger of a saber-toothed tiger around. You're supposed to be relaxed when there is no danger, and that's when the parasympathetic nervous system starts. So the take-home points from this, there is a bi-directional relationship between low testosterone and type 2 diabetes. We should be screening men with type 2 diabetes for hypogonadism and screening men with hypogonadism for type 2 diabetes. If you affect a positive change to one health parameter, it has a subsequent knock-on effect to other parameters within the body. We need to adopt a more holistic approach. Estrogen is incredibly important. It's the forgotten hormone. We need to have a positive impact on weight and liver function. We need to appreciate anabolic versus catabolic, sympathetic versus parasympathetic. They are not mutually exclusive. 
understanding the need for contrast to establish balance is the key to health. We allow psychology to negatively influence physiology. We should be looking to positively influence physiology to positively influence psychology. Thank you very much, guys.